Yeah, so the idea of the Waterfall Slam actually started last year um, from a digital concept that I called The Journey Within. Before I went out to do it, everybody was like, ah, you can't do that in a single season. And I'm like, I think I can with the experts at WTA go out and do this. All starts trip number one, going to Alaska Peninsula, gonna hunt out a cold bay. Handful of sea ducks up there, some puddle ducks, geese, you name it. It's an awesome spot to waterfall hunt and looking forward to getting up there. So when, I, when we laid out the planning for the waterfall slam, and I'll, I'll admit, this was pre-COVID that we had all this lined up. So it was going to Canada, Saskatchewan to start with, and not to say it was gonna be uh, I will say, it was gonna be a lot easier if you could go to Canada to start this than having to do it all in US states. Just because you can go to Canada in September, you can basically get all the goose species, you can pick up a bunch of the dabbling ducks, few divers, you can get the crane, you can get all that odd stuff out of the way and it would almost would have got half, if not more than half the species for the waterfall slam in that first month of September. Um, when COVID kind of restricted the, the border with Canada not being able to go across, I hesitated for a little bit and said, I, I don't know if I'm gonna do it this year, maybe I'll wait to next year, but my problem is I already had so much of the scheduling set for what I was doing and filming this year for my TV shows that I really went and said, hey, this is possible. So I got with Matt and the team at WTA, how do we schedule this, leave some time at the end, but let's go bounce to areas and do this. And I wanted to cover all the flyways and there's certain areas that you just have, you have to go. So Barrows Goldeneye, Kodiak, um, King Eider, you gotta go to St. Paul, you gotta go to Greenland. Like there, there are certain areas that we had to plan in in this mix and then there were some odd ones of like, okay, can't get the crane in Saskatchewan, are we gonna go to Texas or Oklahoma and, and things like that. And really just started putting the pieces of the puzzle together and the scheduling of how do you make this all work and that's, that's how it started. When we originally laid out the plan, the first couple destinations that we had were kind of ones, went to Cold Bay, Alaska. It's kind of like a melting pot of birds. You can get divers, you can get dabbling ducks, you can get geese. Went there to try to take 43 and how do you get as many species off the bat as you can, right, right off the start. And then first couple trips were like that. And then we got very species specific for a while. And towards the end, we were just, okay, what do we have left? Let's go to the best area for that being canvasback. Okay, where's the highest concentration of canvasback? Lake Seminole. Let's go to Lake Seminole, Georgia, and that's where we're gonna hunt for canvasback. Dude, where did those come from? No clue. They came that one's hit. straight into us. That one's hit. So, we just got set up in here. This bright idea for the bag of Chex Mix to enjoy a snack. And I figured I'm gonna eat it right away so that I'm ready. Of course, right away is when the group of Cam Effects tries to land in the decoy, so that didn't go as planned yet again. Catch your ball! You just picked up a bill. Woo! Holy crap, I can't move it. That was just one of those experiences where like, okay, I got, I got the bird I was looking for. You had to get a little bit more aggressive to go and do it. And there were a lot of guys that, hey, would you wanna go stand in water? Cause we were prepared to go out there for the rest of the afternoon. It was gonna be an eight hour stand in water up to here, freezing cold, just, just ready to do it. And that's one of those circumstances that, hey, we adjusted and we had to do what we had to do. It wasn't like the Upland Slam last year to where I went in and I had all this knowledge. I hadn't hunted all the areas, but I had the knowledge of how my dog works, how, how certain grouse work, so I, I had that going in. Waterfall's completely different. It's been a learning curve ever since day one in, in this whole journey. Truthfully, I may have been spoiled last year with the Upland Slam with how easy everything went, and it wasn't easy. I mean, we covered hundreds of miles. The dogs covered an insane amount, and we were on the road a lot. But it was every location that we went to, we we got what we were looking for, both film-wise, species-wise, like the whole story just went together. And from the first spot that we had this year in Cold Bay, instantly realized, hey, the weather, if we're not gonna land on the weather right in these locations, it's not gonna add up very quick. And after those first locations, we were still under 10 species and we'd spent 15, 18 days on the road already. 
We allowed enough in the schedule to go on one or two day trips in the areas to where the species have the highest population this time of year, but it wasn't like we picked up a bunch of those early on. So as we, as we moved on from the first couple locations to where it was, okay, what's the best hunt we can go on today? After we got past that stage and we were targeting one or two or three species at a location, and then it becomes, let's not do what the best hunt is today. Where can we go for a hooded merganser? So we came to Arkansas, hunted, hunted, and I mean, what do you do in Arkansas? You shoot mallards. But we were here for a hooded merganser, a ring neck, a lesser scop on some of the fish ponds, and it was these oddities. And it was interesting to see the guides because they're used to, I want to limit. How do I, how do I limit my guys out? My guys are happy with the limit, and it was kind of that I'm going to be tickled if I shoot a hooded merganser today. And we did, and, and they saw how excited I was, and they're like, and towards the end, they're like, okay, now we get it. Now it's just going out and one. But that's that's the most unique thing about the waterfall slam is it's so weather driven, and trying to go out for one species is completely different. So the upland slam, you're in the area that the birds are. All you got to do is walk a little bit farther. You got to spend another day cover this area versus that area. When you're waterfall hunting, if you're in an area and there haven't been new birds pushed in from a weather front or something, you can't make magic happen, basically, is what we learned with the waterfall slam. If you don't get lucky along the way, it's not you're not gonna be able to accomplish it. The location that sticks out the most to me along this that was different, we went to Maine and hunted with Lance and Emily Robinson. Um, and we were literally set up right on the rock ledge of the ocean. So they just sat there and you had to keep moving back as the tide went up. And that was one of those, like you picture sea duck hunting and sea duck hunting in Maine is what you picture. And that's what we were doing. Dad and I were sitting there and we had eiders going, we had scoters going, we had, we had old squaw going. And that was just one of those to where I always thought about what waterfall hunting would be for sea ducks in Maine. And that was one of those, you're just living in that moment. By far, probably one of the best memories I've had. Which ones were I really looking forward to? Hooded merganser, canvas back, the scoters. I had been able to shoot a harlequin before, but that was just one of those species that, I mean, it's just special. Everything about it's special. So as far as a targeted species, what was the coolest experience? There, there are a couple of them. I'm gonna go with, I'm gonna go with a couple. We, we hunted down in Sonora, again, an area that you should be able to pick up a lot of species. Well, this year, heavy drought. So none of the channels off the main, the main lakes were there. They were all dried up. So they were big lakes, but now you're hunting birds that are centralized in, in the center of these water sources. So we didn't get all the species, but what we did do is we did a Pacific Brant hunt on the coast, literally in the beach, on the beach. So we dug holes in the beach and hunted right on the beach. And you'd have these Brant come right off the Pacific and you were shooting them right on the beach. That was by far one of the coolest experience that we had because the Brant just come it seems like four feet off the water from all the way and you see them hovering all the way through. Um, the other, another good unique one was canvas back hunting Lake Seminole. So when we only picked up a raw, still needed blue and in a common snow, it was, okay, want to do it early in February. Where's the best spot to go snow goose hunting early February? It was a pretty obvious choice, Arkansas, because the majority of the birds are right here. So that's why we picked Arkansas to come back for snows and blues. And I had never conservation hunted before, so I had no idea. It was the first time ever using electronic calls, by far the most amount of decoys that we had set up ever. And it was, it was very unique. Like, I've hunted, hunted geese a lot. And snow geese has always been one of the most tricky to actually get to come into your spread. And it's no different if you're running 2,000 decoys and electronic callers, they're a smart bird. I mean, they, they migrate a lot and they see a lot of different hunting spreads. So it, it takes a lot of magic to get those birds to come in and work. Yeah, so the expectation of, of everybody that books a conservation hunt, except for me, was, hey, how do I come in and I want 50, 100, I want, a, I want the 150 bird flock coming in on top of me and I'm sitting there with no plugs in the gun and I'm just bam, 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 and just seeing birds fall all over the place. And when I went out there, it was, how do I single out a snow goose? How do I really single out a blue? especially with all the specks flying. Like, I don't, want to, I don't want to mess up and shoot a speck, but I, I really want to shoot a blue. So trying to navigate that and it was, hey, it snows down and now a blue's done and like the pressure's off. 
Now let's just have fun and see what comes in. But it was interesting to see how the birds work, the large flocks versus the individuals or doubles. Usually you get that single, all of a sudden it would lock in and you could see it coming just from a mile away, just wings cup coming right into the spring. because I hadn't waterfall hunted 100 days a year and I hadn't seen other species than what are in Michigan. And in Michigan, I think it's I think it's six or seven species over the course of my life in Michigan. So yeah, I can identify a mallard in the year. But other than that, it gets tricky in identifying ducks, what they are in the air, especially when you get dim light situations or overcast. Like today, even with the snow geese and, and the blue geese of identifying, hey, is that a blue goose or is it a speck? Because it was so overcast, you couldn't pick out certain things on them. Wait a second, that might be specks. And even whenever they got right here, I was still questioning myself because it's so dark, but it was blues, it was blues. Well, sweet, got that, that out of the way. Now let's get good. some big old bunches. Let's shoot a bunch of geese. That's what I'm hoping for. I'm ready for that. As Dad said, let's have some fun now. Let's, let's have, have some, some fun, fun now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll blaze away with you. In the research that I, that I did leading up to the upland and then up to the waterfall is that nobody had ever done it before. And the one thing I found in the outdoor industry, if you do something new that's never been done before, you can draw excitement behind it. So how do you tie a cool story that's never been done before with a conservation message underneath it of, hey, look at the habitat that's needed for these birds to go north to south every year. Like that's been a key part of this whole thing too, is the habitat along the way. Like you've noticed different areas of the flyways that birds don't stay anymore. I mean, you guys noted it on the specs here. Like they used to go farther south. Now they only go farther south for a matter of weeks, then they bounce and they stay here. Well, you guys have the perfect habitat for waterfall. Down south with all the hurricanes and everything and the changing agriculture practices, they're not down there for the length of time that they are anymore. So they bounce here which for the last two days, I don't know how many thousands of specks we've seen, but I believe you, they're here. Yeah, so I'm, after this trip to Arkansas, I'm at 40 of 43. I've got one trip left to Sinaloa in Mexico for a cinnamon teal and a fulvous whistling duck. Um, hopefully to pick up a nice Drake shoveler and, and some odd Drake um, blue wing too. But I'll be at 42 of 43 at that point. King is the only one left. I originally planned in early January, we we're gonna head to St. Paul, which is probably, well, it's the only spot in the US that you can go and successfully time after time shoot a king. I mean, there's some kings that are shot on the west, there's west coast, there's some kings that are shot on the east coast. And I think last year, so as an example, there were two king eiders that were shot on the whole east coast of the U.S. last year. Two out of all the days that people waterfall hunted, there were two king eiders. On the west coast, I think there was three. So I mean, you're talking five birds of all the hunters and all the days that are shot in the east and west coast. So you've got to go to St. Paul or you've got to go to Greenland. This year with COVID, they shot St. Paul down to visitors. So couldn't get there in January. So all of a sudden it kind of created a scramble. Where do we plan? The only other spot in North America to go for a king is Greenland. So we've got tentative plans set to go to Greenland, but the only problem is COVID has got restrictions on US citizens going into Greenland. So now we're just, we're waiting. We've got a month and a half of season left over there, hoping that they open the border up so I can go to Greenland. And the second they do, I will be there the next day. Heard all the stories about me. Sometimes a legend is hard to believe. King, yeah, right there off the shore. That's how true they can be. Let's raise a glass to the king. Long live the king. Long live the empire. Yeah, king of.
front. Get in right here. With the upland slam and then the waterfall slam, what I hope to do is just continue this drive of what's the conservation message behind each species of how do you keep them around for generations to come. So I have three young kids that I hope that my age can still hunt and my dad's age are still hunting the same that I'm doing now, but it becomes, it's a lot more difficult because there are a lot more people and agriculture practices change and, and how do you affect these things. Upland was one thing because it was area specific. The, the flyways is unique too because you can catch different areas along the flyway that change and the habitat isn't quite as good and you can see how that affects the duck numbers along the way in the population. Um, for me it, it's pretty sad if you think about hey what's it going to look like 50 years from now if we can continue down this path. Like you can't lose 5% of your population every year for the next 50. I mean, think about what that looks like. Um, so everything I try to do, if it's upland, if it's waterfall, um, big game hunting, it's always, hey, the conservation message around this is we have to change with the times of what it is today to make sure that all these species are around for generations and generations to come.